This is the Alpha Human Podcast, and I am your host, Lawrence Rosenberg. Today's guest is Tony Schwalm, the author of the book, The Gorilla Factory, The Making of Special Forces Officers, The Green Berets. And Tony is uniquely qualified to tell the story of what it takes to forge unconventional warriors as he is a retired lieutenant colonel with the U.S. Army Special Forces who helped redesign the very test of strength, stamina, and wits known as the Q course, which is the training program for entry into the United States Army Special Forces. Tony's military career spans some 30 years, and his journey has seen him transition from a tank commander in Operation Desert Storm, the first Iraq war, where he was awarded the Bronze Star for Valor, to becoming a Green Beret, and later, a commander of Special Forces Officer Training at Fort Bragg. His assignments around the globe include leadership positions in combat operations, humanitarian missions, and counter drug operations. After the attacks of September 11, 2001, Tony served with U.S. Special Operations Command, creating state of the art technology architectures to support special operations forces. From there, as a civilian working with the Department of the Army, Tony led a team of social scientists in support of the Combined Joint Special Operations Task Force, Afghanistan, supporting counterinsurgency operations. Wow, what a resume. Tony, welcome to the podcast. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. Fantastic. So uh, first, let, let's... Uh, Let's figure out, for those who are uninitiated, um, what a gorilla is, right? Because your, your book, The Gorilla Factory, right? But we're not talking, you know, we're talking about a different kind of gorilla. So, right. not uh, monkey business, right? Yeah, so, <laughs> right. So let's, let's talk a little bit about what is a gorilla. A gorilla is a person who decides that there needs to be change and he can't work within the system. Ultimately, a gorilla is somebody has to work very much outside the lines of uh, what we would consider normal. So, um, and we teach this in the Q course, is that uh, guerrilla warfare is inherently criminal to some constituted government because otherwise you would go to the courts or you would sue them or you would you know, peacefully stand in the streets and protest. But when a gorilla decides to uh, engage, uh, that person is normally filled with um, a, a very strong degree of passion uh, for the mission. And so the one thing you find among gorillas is very committed people. Um, uh, you hope very informed because they are most likely going to be compelled to action. Um, uh, you know, someone who, who sits in their house and watches the news and thinks great thoughts, that, that's not a gorilla. Uh, that's, that's the, someone who sits in their house and thinks great thoughts. So <laughs> when you get to guerrilla warfare, you're talking about someone who is, uh, very mobile, uh, uh, finds the resources necessary, uh, wherever he or she ends up operating and, um, uh, inherent in that is someone who goes very lightly wherever they go. And so that's what you normally find with, um, with army special forces and some of the other special operators is um, we're sort of the United States government's guerrilla warfare uh, community. So um, the other thing about a guerrilla, and I, I try to point this out uh, when, I, when I talk to people, the difference between conventional forces and you know, the infantry and armor and things like that, mm -hmm. and, and you know, special operations forces or guerrilla warfare, is we don't hold ground. When you send Green Berets or SEALs or any of those special ops community, we're there to do something to somebody or something and leave. <laughs> so when we stick around, that's when they make movies like Black Hawk Down. Um, so right. you, uh, you, 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 don't, you don't want, when you pin a gorilla down, you don't want to be that gorilla, okay? Because when you're pinned down, you generally travel light and mobile. And when you're forced to fight and hold a piece of ground, it, it doesn't usually go well because the other side can, you know, <laughs> bring everything in the kitchen sink. So um, gorillas have their place. And uh, normally they're the ones that'll go in first. And, uh, and create havoc or make mischief. 
and set the conditions, you know, for, for the big guys, you know, to show up and they'll hold the ground. You know, we want to go back to the rear and work out. Yeah, excellent. Uh, I think that's a really good segue um, to discuss uh, the Green Berets and, and, and who they are, what they are, what the mission is, because the Green Berets are inextricably linked with guerrillas and guerrilla warfare. Uh, and interestingly enough, um, not much really these days is known about the U.S. Army Special Forces. Everyone knows the Navy SEALs. Uh, in fact, most people know the Army Rangers, right? There's, you know, there's members of the Special uh, Operations Forces that people are familiar with, mainly because they get all the, the, the press, the movies are made about them. But there certainly was a time in our history when everyone, and maybe this was uh, around the time of Vietnam, but when everyone knew who the Green Berets were. Uh, but that doesn't, that, that really doesn't uh, exist in the current popular lexicon anymore. And so I think um, we'd love to have you explain for the audience, really get into who the Green Berets are, what they're all about. So uh, Army Special Forces' primary mission is unconventional warfare. And unconventional warfare um, is um, not just everything that conventional warfare isn't. Unconventional warfare is defined um, by law, actually, uh, by U.S. Code, as um, uh, using um, U.S. and indigenous forces uh, to displace um, um, governments or um, juntas or um, country uh, leadership uh, that are adverse to U.S. national interests. And so the whole purpose of unconventional warfare is what you saw in Afghanistan in 2001. Um, that's, that was sort of the classic uh, unconventional warfare where um, you know, three or four teams went into Afghanistan early on, uh, linked up you know, with the Northern Alliance and uh, very rapidly brought um, uh, some uh, strategic cohesion uh, to the different forces uh, that were operating, to the different Afghan forces that were operating there. And they also brought along uh, that thing that everybody loves to have on their side, which is the United States Air Force. So, right. um, you know, the, um, but uh, unconventional warfare is, um, was the unique purview of Army Special Forces until uh, probably about five years ago. And then when the Marine Corps stood up their raiders, um, they are, uh, they have a, a similar training exercise uh, that creates uh, their unconventional uh, warfare capability. But since the early 60s, we've been training unconventional warfare in Western North Carolina to the point that we have the children and grandchildren of role players uh, that come out and support our training. And yeah. that goes to the whole idea of unconventional warfare because the first thing you want to do in unconventional warfare is build rapport. Um, and that's not normally associated with, you know, what we think about in modern warfare is, is, is showing up and trying to make friends. And when you're doing unconventional warfare, the very first thing you want to do is to connect with your guerrilla force and uh, assure them that uh, you're on their side and that you have their interests uh, at heart. And while you're doing that is to never forget that you're there because the U.S. government sent you there. And so you have U.S. national interests. So the, the challenge for special forces is to send uh, soldiers who uh, are you know, capable of you know, what most people, most reasonable people would think of as uh, pretty intense uh, mental and physical endurance, resilience, um, problem solving skills um, when you're separated by uh, great distances from uh, a, a traditional chain of command or the leadership hierarchy that people get accustomed to, especially in the military. And you're making decisions that can put you on the front page of the New York Times. Um, and, you know, and we, we've seen that um, ever since 9-11, uh, when, when you can have individual soldiers, whether special ops or otherwise, uh, do things that can, you know, can get you on the cover of the Washington Post. Mm. So uh, we go through a really rigorous uh, you know, uh, process to make sure we get the right guy 
to send him and 11 of his American buddies to another country, and they may uh, they might double the number of Americans when they get to that country. But when they get there, we trust them that they're going to make the right decisions. And so that comes from months of training and years of what I call operational conditioning and training exercises and to make sure that if the guerrilla warfare does occur, that our guys know exactly what they're going to have to do in the absence of guidance from above. So you're looking for someone, uh, you know, ideally who can, you know, run six minute miles and bench press a house and speak a foreign language, and, you know, and, and, and so, yeah, it's, it's a pretty narrow niche. And, uh, and we're not easy to live with. So, you know, we got a pretty good divorce rate. That's another, that's another line, <laughs> but uh, you know, the, the, you know, the, 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 the reality is, is that you find the same passion among army special forces that you would find a, a, among a guerrilla force in an indigenous uh, population. So, um, so why were the Green Berets formed uh, when they were formed? I think it was around the time of uh, uh, President Kennedy. Kennedy. Mm -hmm. Is that is that correct? Right, it was Kennedy, yeah. And uh, it was created because uh, Kennedy did two things that uh, affected, you know, uh, the, the generation of, uh, of people that are alive today that grew up in the 60s, 70s, 80s. He created the Army Green Berets and he created the Peace Corps. <laughs> And so those two, so those two things uh, represented a vision that President Kennedy had of uh, helping people help themselves. Um, you know, I have a tremendous amount of respect. And in fact, if you look at uh, a TTP between Peace Corps and Army Special Forces, Peace Corps has a, a very similar mission. You need to go in and convince the local population you're there, you know, to help. Uh, which means you share their privations. You share where they where they live, where they get water, how you know how they go to the bathroom, what they eat, um, and uh, and so uh, they were created in order to extend, um, uh, you know, one of the elements of of, uh, of national power is the political, and you know, if anything, special forces is a highly political force. And in, in fact, uh, one of our tenants is uh, always understand the political implications of what you're doing, because we didn't send you there to, you know, uh, blow up a bridge that doesn't need to be blown up. You may need to build a bridge. <laughs> uh, and so we, we send people who have the capacity to think politically, think strategically, think operationally. And, and Kennedy recognized that we needed a force that could operate independently, more independently uh, than a conventional infantryman or, or Marine on the ground and, uh, and, and look for those strategic successes that happen on the ground. Look for the strategic opportunities that happen on the ground. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not who can bench press a house. It's who can bench press the right house. You know, uh, it's the one who can, who, who, who can, who can think through listening to the indigenous population, um, and, and understanding that how do we translate what we brought to the fight to what they need. Um, and, and I think uh, probably President Kennedy uh, understood it and, you know, and I think the, the quote from one of his speeches is, you know, these wars of liberation aren't, aren't liberating anybody, you know. <laughs> you know, when you see the, the fall of certain countries to communist regimes, that, that wasn't liberation. It was, a, it was a great marketing campaign. And uh, Special Forces motto goes to that idea of de oppresso liber, you know, liberate the oppressed. So, you know, it's not death before dishonor or, you know, blood and steel or a lot of really good macho mottos that right. are all competent for their, for their purpose. Our motto is de oppresso liber, you know, liberate the oppressed. So that, that starts you in the right direction. And I, and I think Kennedy recognized uh, probably, um, probably more so than even people in the army at the time that we, that we needed the capability. It looked like army special forces and it probably would be hard to, to keep it fielded, to keep it manned, because you're, you're really demanding a lot of a, of a small group of people. You know, I've, uh, so in reading your book, and uh, I'm not finished with it yet, but um, it's fascinating. Uh, oh. It's, uh, it, it really gives you, I mean, we talk about a bird's eye view of uh, what the Green Berets are all about and what the training uh, is like. But um, in, in drawing an analogy, I want to I want to quote from your book here. I think you really explain the difference between uh, the Green Berets, uh, 
otherwise known as Special Forces or SF, uh, and everyone from the rest of the Special Operations Community or SOF, Special Operations Forces, um, like your Navy SEALs, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. And th the quote is this, it's, while Special Forces may on occasion appear to act like an armed version of the Peace Corps, we are at our core soldiers, which means we are killers and no less killers than Superman and crew. But where Superman intends traumatic amputation, Special Forces brings cancer. We make the body, the host, kill itself. As amputation usually kills faster than cancer, unconventional warfare is unfortunately time consuming. So um, I, I'd love for you to elaborate on this and you know, kind of draw that distinction as, as, you, um, as you call it, Superman uh, and, uh, versus Daniel Boone, uh, right. right? So the, the difference between uh, you know, the, the Green Berets and everyone else, uh, it'd be great to hear you elaborate on this a bit. So I, I use the idea of Superman because he, he shows up, he does something to somebody and, and he saves the day and he, and he flies away. And, and I think for the American narrative, we, we like that. We, we enjoy it. It, it. it fits inside the uh, sort of the 20 minute, you know, uh, uh, television, you know, uh, you know drama. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and you, you, you know, you get bathroom breaks and, you know, you can get something to drink and then, oh, it's over and it's good and we won again. And, and the problem with, um, the problem with Daniel Boone is that, you know, when, and I, I, you know, I, when I used that analogy, I went back and read about Daniel Boone. He's like, you know, he went off on some of his expeditions lasted a couple of years, you know, to the point that he was gone so long, his wife thought he was dead and married his brother. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like, he came back and said, oh, I feel really bad. Uh, but, um, so you, and when you consider the skill set of Daniel Boone, uh, which is a lot of what we train in survival school, and, and all of SOF goes through uh, the, the, the survival school where we actually learn those, those skills that are a lot more like Daniel Boone. But when we go out the door, when Special Forces goes out the door, we generally know we're leaving for months, if, if not at least a year, um, to go do a mission. It could take a long time to even start to get off the ground. What happened in Afghanistan was truly phenomenal with how fast, um, you know, we had positive results. I mean, within, within weeks, months, um, you know, we, it looked like we were about to win. And then when we did win, it was, you know, at that moment we had won. Um, it, was, it was not because, you know, we, we had sent, um, you know, uh, 36 of the best shooters in the special operations community, we sent guys that, you know, by, by virtue, and I actually can say I did train one of those captains who, who went there, uh, was, you know, recently profiled in one of the movies. And I, when I say I trained him, I was part of his, the, the training while he was going through the Q course. But who knew he knew how to ride horses and shoot, you know? Uh, you know, and, uh, and that's a, uh, but that was a skill that he brought that we didn't know. But, he knew he could use it and you know he didn't have to have to ask permission at the same time um, we would have been surprised if he had asked for permission to do any of those things so we're looking to create a culture in special forces where you have the time that's not normally uh, allowed you know I mean when you do a direct action mission or a raid or you set up for an ambush or things like that um, those are over in hours, maybe you measure it in days. Mm -hmm. Anything in unconventional warfare or the other side of the unconventional warfare coin, which is foreign internal defense, which is uh, kind of what's happening in Afghanistan now, is once, once the bad guys are gone, then you have to get the good government to do what needs to be done uh, in order to sustain itself once it's, you know, once it's established and to, to keep going to, you know, to, to be a functioning government. Um, so you have a um, uh, uh, you have a culture that's built around the idea that um, I'm, I'm going away, I'm going to be gone a long time, mm -hmm. um, and there may not be phones, you know, there won't be cell, you know, cell phones, you know, coverage or anything. And um, 
that's very different than the guys that load up into a black helicopter, go onto a target, you know, and get Bin Laden and, and, and come back. Uh, it's a very, uh, while it was not visible at the moment, it was a very visible mission on the other side. So there are all kinds of dramas that have played out in, in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, where, you know, Army Green Berets and, and now, you know, some SEAL platoons and, and, and some of the Marine Special Ops teams, you know, ha have gone and disappeared inside the culture for, you know, months and, and, and you know, and, and performed operations that, you know, risked, you know, a, a lot that, will, that won't see, um, you know, any of this type of notoriety. Uh, that you, you, you see with, uh, you know, with those traditional, you know, direct action missions, mm -hmm. um, counterterrorism missions. So um, we, we train to go long, and that means we have to create uh, a force that thinks on a, a very long time horizon versus, you know, something that lasts, you know, a few hours. They, they start with an understanding that this is, this is going to be at least months. Uh, and that 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 changes the uh, that changes the dynamic once you've injected that that attitude up front. Powerful. Um, so let, let's talk about. I actually have another question I want to ask um, before, but I also, I'm going to try to save that because I want to get into your journey. Okay. So I'd I'd love to know um, how you got involved in all of this, like you know, because. I mean, your career traverses a, a long period of time, and you've done some um, really uh, amazing things in that in, in that span, and uh, and have really become an expert uh, in you know a number of areas from from again from from being a I believe they call it a tankist, or, Thank right? You. Uh, a tank commander. It, you, you're a, you're a tank commander in Iraq, <laughs> then you're a Green Beret, then then you're um, then you're uh, commander for, for officer training at special, uh, at U.S. Army Special Forces. So that's su such an interesting transition. But I'd love to know what, what got you interested in joining the military in the first place, joining the Army, and then take us through your journey. So uh, I would have to say that one of the, um, one of those watershed moments in my life was when I was about 12. I saw this movie called Billy Jack. Oh. And uh, Billy Jack. And um, I wanted to be like Billy Jack, and uh, and it was this. Uh, there's a there's a line in there. He says, you know, you're you're going to do some of that Green Beret stuff, you know, or, or words to that effect. And I was like, well, I mean, I'd seen the movie The Green Berets, and I was like, well, that didn't look like John Wayne. You know, what is this? Right. And so that idea stayed with me all the way through high school. When I when I got to college. Um, you know, uh, I was a, uh, you, know, a you know, sort of a, a wandering freshman and sophomore. And uh, I got to a place where, um, you know, I, I needed to pay for college. And there was a Rossi scholarship out there. And I was able to win the Rossi scholarship. And as soon as I won the scholarship, it was sort of like, you know, all those, all those childhood dreams sort of flooded back into me. Mm. And, uh, and I, I mentioned this a, a little bit in the book. It was like, you know, I'd seen the movie Patton. And I was like, wow, you know, that would be pretty amazing to be a patent. Well, you need a war. You need a really big war if you're going to do patent. And right. by the time I came into the Army, everybody was, you know, this was in the mid-'80s, and it was, you know, we, nobody really knew what was going on with the Soviet Union. But, you know, we, we'd been sort of rattling sabers for, you know, a few decades, and mm -hmm. nothing really had happened, you know. And um, then... Um, uh, I ended up uh, going to uh, to Fort Riley, Kansas, and you know they said, "Well, you really, you know, you're you know, well, you're never going anywhere." Well, and then Iraq invaded Kuwait that summer, and uh, suddenly we had a really big war, and I was going to be a tank commander in a really big war, and I said, "Oh my goodness, okay, uh, wow!" And when I came back from that, I considered, you know, that that was probably the last really big war that we were going to have where tanks fought. And I didn't feel like I was done doing what I wanted to do as a soldier. And so I, 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 you know, I blew the dust off of that dream to, to, to see if I could, you know, be like Billy Jack. <laughs> so okay. um, I, uh, I went to the Q course. Um, 
graduated and um, can, can I can can I ask wait let, let me sure. just um ha, okay I mean can anyone who has served in the army just decide they want to try out for the uh the, the special forces that's a great question yes um I in in my Q course I had mechanics I had cooks now I would say probably half were probably infantrymen who had served you know everywhere from Ranger Battalion to 82nd Airborne 101st you know light infantry mech infantry and then we had guys that were we you know we had guys that were mechanics you know uh, we guys that were uh, a medic uh, and you have a very uh, diverse population and and this is one of the the places where you you can see the strength and diversity because when you show up to another country um you, you don't know what you're going to find and so the fact that we had a wheel mechanic on on some of the teams the guy knew how to fix cars well that who knew that would be a skill that we you know mm -hmm. we'd, we'd fall back to or somebody's mom was german and so he spoke german you know and i mean you just it didn't matter that he he could carry a rucksack you know 500 miles with you know a, a, an engine block on the back it was you know, there's this diversity. So yeah, people people come from all over the army, and they have to all go through the same filter, the three week selection course, and um, that does a pretty good job of weeding out the people who are there, you know, because they really like the hat, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. Great. <laughs> Everyone wants to. <laughs> I want that. You know, I like the hat. Oh well, yeah. Well, that. You know, once you're in the community, you don't care about wearing the hat, especially if you're walking around a group headquarters because everybody's got the hat. So you're, you're not very special when everybody's special. Um, but uh, yeah, you, you can. And, and so that's why there's a very high washout rate. Um, and, and, it, and it should be. I mean, we're, we, we really do. And most people quit. They don't get thrown out. They quit when they go to selection. And, how, and so and how many intakes are there per year? Uh, my numbers are dated, uh, but Is I would it? say on any, I would say on any, any given year, probably, uh, somewhere between 2000 and 3000 will volunteer depending on what's going on in the army. Okay. Um, and from that, uh, easily, uh, 60, 60%, 50% usually, but it, you know, it can be 60%. It can be high if it's a hard class, if you have a, you know, you can get a 70% washout rate in selection. And then when you get to the Q course, and, and some of this is some people quit, uh, most people quit, but uh, I mean, it, it is a high risk operation. You can't get hurt. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, you have a, a 20 something and you know, thinks he's bulletproof and, and mm -hmm. bomb proof and all the other proofs. And, um, you know, you fall out of an airplane and your chute doesn't deploy well and you're at night and you can't see it, you, you know, you'll break. And so, um, it doesn't happen often, but it does happen. And so the, you know, in, in fairness to those that, you know, hit the wall because of their body breaking that, that, you know, it does happen. But, uh, usually, uh, the people who are committed, they'll heal and they'll come back. Um, the people who quit, mm, they don't really know, they, we don't let them come back. Uh, cause if you quit on us now, you'll probably quit on us down range. So we, we really don't. It, something exceptional has to be there. Uh, and so by the time you finish from that, uh, let's say 2,500, you'll maybe get 400 make it, 500 make it uh, over a year. Okay. All right. And so you were one of the, so you were one of the, uh, uh, the chosen who made it. Yes. Um, and I will say that that's where you learn teamwork. You know, that's where, uh, and I write about this in the book, even in training, um, you know, you, you start forging bonds that will end up uh, following you into the groups when you, when you, when you actually show up in a real unit. Um, and um, there, was, there was a couple of times where I made mistakes in the, in the training when I, I, I could have been bounced. And, um, and I do write about one of those, and I'm thinking about it as we're talking. Uh, I walked away from my weapon. I was, I, I hadn't had sleep in about, you know, two or three days. And, Right. Um, and uh, one of uh, one of the NCOs uh, on the on the team uh, actually, you know, he did, he saw it happen, and um, he he came up to me. I was standing in a circle uh, talking to other officers and to the to the training cadre, and and they were I was just sort of kind of looking at me like you know there's something wrong with you, and I'm like oh, you know why is somebody staring at me? 
-hmm. And then this NCO, this, this, you know, this sergeant who I probably owe my career to, came up behind me and said, uh, hey, sir, I, I, I fixed your weapon. And he handed it to me as if he had repaired it. That was his cover story. Wow. And I said, oh, thank you so much, sergeant. <laughs> and it's like, oh, now I get to graduate the Q course. And I haven't wasted a year of my life. <laughs> you know, thank you, for, <laughs> thank you for taking care of me when I didn't even realize I had screwed up. Um, so, so that's so, the type of relationships you build. And that's the type of, that's, when I say I made it, yeah, I, I made it. But, you know, the, the team helped me a lot. So first you have to go through um, a, a selection and assessment process, I think, which you mentioned was three, which is three weeks. And then from there, then if you, if you don't quit then and you, and you pass the assessment, then you can go through the Q course. And there's a number of phases in, in the Q course that you go through. You, you learn a few things, um, to say the least. Um, so we'd love to kind of get in, in, into what those phases are. So the, um, the first, the first phase is, is generally associated with the, the soldier skills that most people think of as, you know, commando, guerrillas, you know, you, you learn how to walk as a group, you know, through the woods. And this is where it doesn't matter if you came from the infantry or you were a mechanic. Uh, we'll, we'll teach you to go through the woods, you know, as, as part of a special forces detachment. Um, and, and, and because ultimately we are soldiers and we have to be able to train other people to be soldiers, so we need to be masters of soldier skills. And so that, that first phase of training is, is generally associated with, you know, learning, you know, light infantry tactics, because that's, that's generally what we're going to do. Um, then we break out into um, the individual skills. So you have a, a weapon sergeant, you have uh, engineers, and they're both construction and destruction. <laughs> um, right. And then you have uh, communicators. Uh, that learn any any number of methods of and you know uh, telephony, uh, IT communication, um, and then you have the the ones that are probably the hardest ones, which is our our 18 deltas, the, the medics, uh, and that's basically four years of med school crammed into one year, um, culminating in a final exam where they shoot the goat, and if your goat dies, you don't get to be a medic. You know, <laughs> it's like a it's wow. called live tissue training, and uh, wow. and um, and, and the goat doesn't feel anything and there's no torture. The, the goat's completely anesthetized. But, and I say that because that's one of the reasons that 18 deltas are, are so revered across the board in the entire Department of Defense is because they, 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 they really have a, a pass fail final where they, they have to keep the goat alive a certain amount of time and demonstrate all the skills necessary because when you're the guy hit, you want that guy. That's not the first time you ever touched a, a living being to keep it alive and then your um um i don't think i think that's all of them yeah weapons and then the officers and so the officers when they break out and this is the, the part that i was in charge of was mm -hmm. the, the, what brings the officer to the table is his planning skills his, his management skills his leadership skills and so we spend about two months um intense um uh, uh, training the officers to plan uh, how, to, how to think politically, how to, how to think operationally, not hyper tactical, you know, uh, not worried about, um, you know, doors and uh, windows and, you know, worry about cities and, and blocks and, you know, and, and plan for missions with an understanding that, that what you do, um, you, you know, could have political ramifications all the way to the White House. And so we spend a lot of time making sure that the officers understand. And, and, then, and I, the, the quote that it was, the, the students used to laugh at me, I said, you need to think of yourself as a strategic resource. You're like a nuke with boots, okay? So <laughs> you, need to, you need to think of yourself that way. And even if you don't get treated that way or, you know, oh, you're just an Army captain, it's like, it doesn't matter. When, when you go downrange, you're, you are an agent of the president. And when you do things, because there's, there's no visible chain of command over an SFODA, a Special Forces Operational Detachment Alpha, that 12-man that team. Mm -hmm. You can't see that chain of command. No, normally that chain of command um, is, is not even in the same country. Uh, so um, we spend a lot of time making sure that the officers understand their role. And then the last phase of training is the unconventional warfare. Um, and, th and that's where we go out and we spend uh, more than a few weeks um, teaching the guys, you know, the, 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 the planning, 
um, and, and, and the skills necessary to plan an unconventional warfare campaign. And then they go out and they do the capstone exercise, which is Robin Sage. And that's held out in Western North Carolina. And that's where we have the children and grandchildren of, of role players. There's probably 250 to 300 role players that live in Western North Carolina who know as much about unconventional warfare as any Green Beret because they've been role players wow. for 30 years. You know, um, and it's uh, and the police force is brought in, and fire departments are brought in, and there's just and they're all they they play a role, um, and that's how we get those guys to a level of thinking that they wouldn't normally find. So, so can you elaborate on Robin Sage? What is Robin Sage? So Robin Sage, uh, and his name for um, uh, I think it's Colonel Sage uh, was he was an unconventional warfare expert from World War II. Um, and the, um, the scenario is, is that Western North Carolina turns into pine land. And so pine land is a country that's been invaded and, uh, the occupiers are oppressive and they are adverse to us national interests. Mm -hmm. And so the president signs a finding. And so the scenario unfolds while you're in isolation and that's how we plan the mission. We go into the little hooches and we, we start working the isolation issue so that so that you're totally incommunicado when you go into that you're, you, you don't talk to mama or daddy or whoever you're done you you are you disappear for your isolation and you usually spend uh you get about a week in the isolation facility you're escorted to and from uh you know physical training if you go to the gym if you go to the mess hall anything where you leave you're escorted so that you do not break isolation you do not compromise the mission um, and the role players play the game really hard. And then uh, the last thing you do uh, before you go is you do your brief back. And so you take all the information that's been fed to you doing your planning while you're in isolation. You turn that into your unconventional warfare plan and mm -hmm. you brief that and you brief it to a real, normally a, a sitting battalion commander or a sitting group commander, either a lieutenant colonel or a full colonel. Sometimes a, a general officer will come in and take it. And uh, because you're the future. You're the future of the branch. And so we want to hear what, what did you come up with? And you hear some, and I've taken a lot of the brief back, and you hear some really, you know, I mean, you're, you're listening for things that will obviously not resonate if they actually did this for real. Okay. And so um, and just for example, we had a, you know, I remember one uh, detachment commander of the, of the student team uh, said, and we're going to go in because there was a, they'd been briefed, there was a threat of, of chemical agents, that, there was, that gas had been used. And so they said, you know, we're going to, trying to figure out, you know, if we can jump in with pro masks, if we can wear protective masks. And so I asked the question, so are, are you bringing protective masks for all your gorillas? And he sort of thought about it, goes, well, I said, how many, how many gorillas do you think you're going to link up with? You know, 70, 100? You're going to go in with 100 masks? Or are you going to be the guy that says, oh, looks like a gas attack. <laughs> hey, I got mine. <laughs> okay, that doesn't breathe well, you know. Um, and you, and then they go, well, so we're going without masks. It's like, correct. You'll, you'll go without masks. And yes, there is a chemical threat. And so welcome to special forces and, or wow. don't go. And so, and then the, normally it's a, we jump into, uh, we jump into some of the big drop zones out in Western North Carolina that look like the Uwari National Forest or Pisgah National Forest and mm -hmm. people's farms. And, uh, and there are some drop zones that are pretty hairy. I mean, they have to turn off high tension lines. And so there are people in the area that go without power for the two hours that the planes overhead throwing students out of it while these guys land in this open field. And, wow. you know, and uh, you hope that no student ends up, you know, 70 feet off the ground entangled in a high tension line and, you know, they have to delay the power coming back on. Um, and people break legs on infill. You know, infiltration is, is it's dangerous. It's intended that way. Uh, but it, all the risks are mitigated. People do the best they can with what they have to do. And now lots of people jump out of airplanes at night with stuff on. Um, but the scenario that these students jump into is that there's, there's no one on the drop zone except them. This is, this is a blind drop zone. This is, you know, the plane flew over and it's like, you know, this is like the movies. And, um, and then uh, they link up with their gorillas and they build rapport and that's a whole skill set tested you know you know the gorillas will in, in always the role players will always try to antagonize and insult and you know they want the instructors want to see can the student overcome this 
you know. Um, and it's, it has nothing to do with shooting. It has everything to do with emotional quotient, you know, people skills. Right. Uh, and uh, those aren't things that are normally associated with, you know, barrel tested freedom fighter. And they're absolutely the one skill that you have to have. And this is why language is such a big deal. So after everybody graduates and they, they finish their, their unconditional warfare, um, you know, they go to language school. And um, I'm not sure if they still do it, but there was a time when you weren't getting your beret until you graduated the language school and had tested out in your language. So the idea is that we, we don't go in with translators. Um, now the reality is, is the, the world's a big place and there's lots of languages and sometimes you, know, you do have to have a translator to, to get it done. But what you learn in special forces very quickly is whoever's translating is the, uh, inherently the informal leader. And uh, okay. there's, there's not a special forces guy on the ground that wants to use a translator. None of us ever want to depend on a translator. Uh, we we want to hear, we want to know, you know, what's being said in the tongue of, of the indige. And um, because we, we can hear passion, we can hear sincerity, um, or we think we can. Um, and we want to hear it in that language. And you said the indige, that stands for the indigenous? indigenous yeah, the indigenous people. And, right. uh, and as we're sitting here talking, I'm, you know, a, a lot of this stuff is, is cranking back up in my mind. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. And I have to be careful. You know, there's always the, the rule of uh, retirees is, you know, the older I get, the better I was. So you see me going <laughs> off the rails, you know, to say, Tony, remember, you know, the older you get, right? Gotcha. Yeah, of course. Um, and, and so you mentioned the locals. Um, so they play the indigenous, they role yeah. play this out as the indigenous people? Yeah, they are Pine Landians. They're all, they all know about Pine Land. They swear allegiance to Pine Land. This is fascinating. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, and this subculture goes back 50, uh, uh, I think the original Robin Sage was called uh, Gobbler's Hollow. And um, there are people whose grandchildren will tell you that, you know, they remember when, you know, the Green Berets were training in Western North Carolina in the 60s, getting ready for Laos and Cambodia and Vietnam. Wow. And um, yeah, there are, uh, I mean, there are people that, um, uh, it, it's almost like their side job. I mean, they're paid, they're, they're compensated for their time. Uh, okay. and, uh, we have, uh, we have dinners, we have lunches, we have, uh, volunteer, uh, lunches once a year where all the role players come in, uh, I say volunteers, all the role players come together. We have a big barbecue out there in Troy, North Carolina or near Troy, North Carolina. And, um, and, you know, people share their stories, you know, but I mean, um, it's a very, uh, it, it's a very unique setting, but I mean, there are people whose barns you know, probably hundreds of student detachments have hidden in their barns, you know, while they were, you know, going through Robin Sage or um, uh, there's a, a, a gentleman that um, at the end of Robin Sage will, will normally do uh, um, humanitarian assistance missions. And it's actually written into the script that we're helping you know, people now that we've liberated Pineland. You know, we were there and the forces came back and Pineland's liberated. And so we were, uh, there was a, one older gentleman who had always let us use his land. And in return, we cut him firewood. Well, we cut him firewood like probably about 15 cords of firewood for him. Like he's probably still burning the wood that we left him, you know, because wow. of, of how important it is to have the local population on your side. And so there's a, there's a double message. There's a, there's, a, there's a double meaning to the message. One, we want the local population in Western North Carolina to know that we absolutely appreciate them accommodating us. And two, we want to impress upon the students, this is what it looks like when you think you're done, you're not done. You're gonna ride around with chainsaws and axes and picks, and you're gonna help these people that allowed you to use their land while you were doing your training. So it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very neat exercise. I don't, I don't know another one even close to it. Has Pineland ever not been liberated? No, it's always been liberated. You know, it's always we've you know once a, you know four times a year, Pine Land makes it. You know, and uh, <laughs> it's a uh, yeah, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's wonderful to be part of that and to realize that you're you know you're you're in a tradition that was started by people that really didn't know what was going on. They they weren't really sure what to do. Wow. Now, also um, in the book, um, I I read a bit about 
your um, your training in uh, survival, evasion, resistance, and escape. Is that pronounced SEER? SEER yeah, here. Mm -hmm. training? Yeah. Mm -hmm. SEER training. So, I mean, once again, it sounds like a lot of role playing going on there. And it, it gets, I mean, it gets pretty hairy. I mean, people getting interrogated, people getting, you know, smacked around. Um, you know, so can you, can you describe a little bit about what that is? What, what do Green Berets go through when they're going through um, SEER training? So the, uh, everybody who has a high risk of capture uh, is supposed to go through level C SEER, which is, you know, um, you know, basically, uh, you know, it, it's a, it's a full mission profile, you know, resistance training laboratory, which is um, a, a mock POW camp. Um, and that POW camp is almost every SEER compound, uh, training compound is built on the one very similar to the one that you find at Fort Bragg, the one that we went through. And it was designed by uh, Colonel Nick Rowe, who, who lived in a tiger cage in Vietnam for five and a half years when he escaped. Uh, really? His story is Five Years to Freedom. And if you want to read a, a story of a, a true American uh, patriot, uh, uh, you know, Colonel Nick Rowe is, uh, is that guy. And so based on um, his experiences for five years and resisting um, you know, the indoctrination and interrogation of, uh, of, of Viet Cong, uh, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, we have pretty much, uh, we have a pretty good model of, you know, how bad it can be in training. So, you know, they, you, you get slapped around and I, you know, it, as an adult, it's just not, at least in this country, it's not normal for an adult male to be open-handed slapped. Right. You know, you know, it, it, I don't know. I it just, one of those things that just sort of jars you and you realize how humiliating it is to be slapped. And, um, and so, um, when we went through, um, uh, my, uh, the whole class was officers when we went through, uh, which creates its own dynamic. But, um, the, the training gets to the point where, you know, between sleep deprivation and food deprivation, um, there are times when people forget that they're in North Carolina in a training environment. And uh, you'll see, um, you know, you'll see people, uh, let, me, let me see if I can say this well. You'll see people forget it's training. And um, they start behaving as if they really are POWs, like they really are prisoners of war. Mm. And, um, you know, um, they accommodating what the role player enemy, you know, you have enemy role players are wanting them to do, uh, which is maybe turn on another student. And so uh, there's a, there's a part I talk about in the book where group think took over and a bunch of students turned on another student. And fortunately other students in the class recognized what was going on and and blew it up. You know, they just intervened and, and caused and, and de-escalated it and defused it. Mm -hmm. um, but um, some good friends of mine were in that class, and we've compared notes because, for me, Sears School was one of the most emotional events um, because you're 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 forced to publicly state things about who you are. Um, you know, what do you believe? You know, do you believe in God? Well, who, who is your God? You know, do you believe you don't believe in God? Well, why don't you believe in God? Everybody else believes in God. What's your problem? And so if you can't defend, if you correct me, if you don't, if you're not comfortable in your own skin, mm -hmm. you're going to have a really rough time going through Sears school because you, you, you can't defend yourself because you don't know who you are. And, uh, and let's be clear. A lot of people go through Sears school. And I said this in the book, it's like a weight loss clinic, you know, it's like, okay, let's get this over with. I was in a leadership position when I went through and, um, I really felt like it was something I wanted to do, to do well. You know, mm -hmm. I was like, I want to fulfill this role. And, and so ultimately, the one thing uh, I will say about SEER school, it's the one training you hope you never use. You never want to have to use your SEER school. You really, really never want to be in what we, in, in the worst case scenario is unassisted evasion. And um, where, you know, you, you have a situation where you, you've gone on an unconventional warfare mission. You've experienced a, a phrase that I, I have seen uh, in the real world, a catastrophic loss of rapport. 
you have catastrophic loss of rapport, it means that your gorillas have turned on you, and that means that the local population has turned on you, and now you're trying to get out. So this is like escape from New York on steroids. Wow. Um, and you don't want that to be the case. So we work really, really hard to make sure we're sending people that aren't going to have catastrophic loss of rapport ever. And if they do, and then what happened to the, the legend holds pretty well, and, and this is true, but the legend holds that a team was uh, going through Robin Sage, uh, their, their instructor set them up for what they felt was catastrophic loss of rapport. And so without saying anything to anyone, they slipped out of the G base and they slipped 70 miles south into South Carolina before they popped up and said, okay, we, we're where we're supposed to be for emergency exit <laughs> and the cadre, we were, everybody was losing their mind because the students did what they were trained to do. And there was, I mean, you had 12 students fully kitted with real rifles. They didn't have real ammo, but they had, you know, everything on them was right. real except ammo. And they sneaked 70 miles <laughs> from wow. where we were in Western North Carolina down to where they had planned in case, because you always plan for unassisted evasion. You hope you never use it. Mm -hmm. They executed their plan. And so you know, going forward from then, <laughs> we were all, all the students are always warned, hey, if you think you've experienced catastrophic loss report, you tell us, you, the cad, you tell us, the cadre, before you decide you're going to do your, <laughs> okay, you, because wow. we're going to tell you you're not doing it, okay, because, I mean, they blew up the whole training scenario. I mean, they were gone for like five days, um, but they, you know, they all graduated, and they were committed for their <laughs> evasion skills, you know, because, I mean, a lot of real, real police forces were looking for them. It's like, you know, hey, we, we, these students think this is what they were supposed to do. Please help us. If you see our students, please call us. No one saw them. Wow. Yeah. So, and, and, and do you, so are you evaluated or is it, you have to, you have to escape in order to complete the, no. the course? Yeah. No, you don't escape. Uh, okay. You plan an escape. Okay. Um, you plan an escape. Um, but the way you're evaluated, it's not a pass or fail. I, I will tell this story very quickly. Um, you can fail. Uh, so, um, you're trained in resistance techniques, and, I, and there's nothing to give away. The, the the techniques are sensitive, but if you're if you're a good liar in the seventh grade, you you have all the resistance techniques that we teach. Okay, if you're a good seventh grade liar. He's on it. Okay, you're, okay. You're, you you got it. Um, but we have a uh, uh, we had a student, um, and I think most anyone who's ever seen the John Wayne movie knows that if you're ever captured, you you say the big four, nothing more. That's a a little mnemonic, you know, and it's your your name, rank, social security, or name, rank, social security number, date of birth, or serial number, date of birth. Right. And, uh, and that's all you're legitimately supposed to be asked. Okay. And of course, that, you know, that's about three seconds into your first interrogation. So um, you, you're, you're trained in all these resistance techniques, but they can only do so much to you. I mean, if, you, if you're okay with being slapped, if you're okay being, you know, locked in a squat box or, you know, uh, made to do a million push-ups or, you know, anything that they can think of to, to make your life miserable. If you can survive all that and think that you're just never going to do the big porn anymore, you're not going to make it. And so there was one student who had, um, who had decided that um, he wasn't, he didn't care and he wasn't going to say anything but the big four. And uh, so the last night of, uh, of our time in the mock POW camp, he was singled out for <laughs> special high intensity training. Okay. And uh, they took him into a room with another student and pulled a pistol and stuck it to the other student's head and asked um, the hard case um, a question that a truthful answer would not have changed anything. A truthful answer to that, I'm not going to try to explain it all, but they asked him a question that he could have told the truth and it wouldn't have mattered. Okay. He could have lied and they couldn't have confirmed or denied it. He could have done probably anything except what he did. And it's, again, this is, led, this is now part of the legend. He, 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 as it goes from the instructor who related the story to us, he said, uh, now understand the instructor is standing there in a role player as an interrogator. It's a concrete, bare concrete floor room, you know, uh, two-way mirrors all around. And uh, he's holding a pistol to a student's head. And he asks the question. And the hard case says, well, 
he's a volunteer knowing well the hazards of his chosen profession. And, and, and your facial expression is exactly what everyone else that heard this said. It was like, did he just say what I think he said? Wow. Yeah. He said, and the, the instructor came completely out of role. He put the pistol down, told the student that was kneeling, get out of here. And then they brought all the cadre in and just went to town on this guy. So would you really let us kill this guy? Wow. What, what was your problem? What were you thinking? And he says, I, I, I just made up my mind that I wasn't going to do anything but the big four. He goes, so when that wasn't working, now what? He goes, I, I, I don't know. He goes, and so he spent like the next hour convincing them why he should be allowed to get a Green Beret and not be bounced out of a course right there. So that's where we find people, we find vulnerabilities, we find, you know, um, idiosyncrasies that you really don't want to find when you're in another country and it's a real gun with real bullets. Right. Better to find out now. Better to find out before it comes down to that. Exactly. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I, th right. So that's the joke. With those of us in the class, we always see each other. They, 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 he's a volunteer. No one will add to the show of the profession. <laughs> Feel bad for you. <laughs> wow. Wow. So, okay. So, so then let's fast forward a little bit. I um, want to talk about so again, through your journey and, um, you know, at some point you're, uh, you're back, uh, at the Q course, but this time as a commander of, of officer training, what, you know, as a commander, did, did you make any innovations? Was there anything that you, you changed, uh, about the, uh, about the course with, you know, what, what was, you know, being in, in that position to now, um, add some of your experience uh, to to actually the training piece. Um, you know, how, how can you tell us a little bit about that? So we had um, right as I took over the course, uh, there had been an idea to go back to small group instruction and assign um, you know seasoned, uh, successful uh, SF captains who were waiting to make major to come back and be small group instructors, and so. Um, if I got to leave any thumbprint on the course, it was, it was how, how that was executed. Mm. Um, and, and we worked very hard at, at, at creating scenarios that, that were as close to, um, full, we call it full mission profile, as, as close to something that, that the student would see when he got to a train, to a real group, uh, or when he deployed. And, um, and, 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 and it was, it was fun. I mean, you just, I can't say it any other way. It was just fun. You know, I mean, you, you get to hang out with, you know, people that, you know, are, are spectacular in their own field and mm -hmm. very comfortable in their skin. And you have a whole group of, you know, army captains, most are infantry, but they're, they're coming from all different walks and, and they want to figure out how to be like you. And so, you know, the, you know, the, the innovations probably don't last that I, that I put in place, you know, probably didn't last two commanders after I left, but, the um, you know while I was there, um, we were able to try things, and uh, probably the greatest validation that I've had in my career was when students that we trained went to Afghanistan in 2001 and 2002, mm -hmm. and uh, and twice I had a phone call, you know out of the blue, uh, a former student had found me. He said, you know, I just wanted to tell you that what you taught us. Um, worked. And, um, you know, when, when, you know, when, when you're, you, you know, you, 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 you miss the Super Bowl because of age or assignment or whatever, it's mm -hmm. really nice to have somebody come back from the winning team and say, hey, you know, that, that play you gave us worked, you know, and, uh, and so I, you know, without, without belaboring it, I just, uh, uh, I felt really good about my time at the schoolhouse and, uh, and the time that, you know, and where we were, um, you know, where, where we were in time, you know, the people that, that ended up going to Afghanistan and, and some of the things that, you know, I know that the, the cadre gave them uh, that made them what they, what they had to do to do it. And that's what you call it, the schoolhouse. Is that what it's yeah. called? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 You know, yeah. The Special Warfare Center. Special Warfare Center. And then, um, so you mentioned something there, um, and I know this from reading your book, but you said when you missed the Super Bowl, 
right? It's, it's great uh, to hear what you heard that you were able to help some of these, um, some of these athletes, right, of the special forces um, be able to succeed while they were over in Afghanistan. Uh, the Super Bowl, what you're, ta- what you're referring to is, if we fast forward, um, it's interesting, again, talking about your journey, you go from being a tank commander in Iraq and now um, all these years later, um, in uh, when um, so the attacks for uh, the September 11th attacks took place, uh, you were actually at SOCOM and you you were part of the uh, leadership uh, team, if I'm if I'm correct, that was going to figure out the budget for what the special forces. Uh, and the sp- uh, special, uh, the special, um, the the soft guys, what uh, what they were going to use, the equipment they were going to get, and and how it was going to get funded, I- I- is that correct? Uh, so the um, we had a um, right after nine eleven, and we finally figured out what we were going to do. Uh, when I say we, the United States government figured out, you know, this this wasn't going to be, you know, um, you know, bombing or you know, cruise missiles or you know, sanctions or something, we were, we were going to go put some boots on the ground. Um, and it looked like it was going to be an unconventional warfare. And uh, we knew 5th Special Forces Group out of Fort Campbell was on tap to go. And so my little, I was in charge of this little ad hoc team of uh, two other SF guys, a SEAL. Um, we had Air Force representation. And um, we had the uh, comptroller from the Department of Defense, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Dove Zakheim, uh, you know, said, um, "Could could you use a billion and a half dollars?" Oh. <laughs> yes, sir. I, I, we probably could spend a billion and a half. And so when we got finished, we'd actually allocated about 1.8 billion. But what we got to do, uh, specifically, you know, to to what we ended up doing on the ground was to figure out the budget to run an unconventional warfare to stand up about three divisions of guerrillas, three divisions of fighters, not, not necessarily guerrillas, although most of them were at that time, about three divisions of guerrillas. And so we just did truly some, you know, back of the, back of the uh, cocktail napkin uh, math. And we figured we needed about $300 million to, to make it happen on the ground. And I'm glad that's what we came up with because that's what we got along with the other you know, 1.5 billion that came along. And I mean, you knew you had spent enough money when, when the components, you know, the SEALs, and the Rangers, everybody came back and said, we don't need anything else. <laughs> I said, somebody record this. <laughs> um, and so that was, it took us about two weeks and we obligated uh, 1.8 billion. Uh, and then it, that's when the guys were flowing out the door. and. Um, you know, uh, the teams were going in and, um, you know, we were just, you know, we were, we were watching the Super Bowl and we were, you know, just ecstatic that at that phase, that, you know, we'd been able to help fund the team. Right. And, um, you know, you, you talk about um, that being like the quintessential uh, victory of the unconventional warfare doctrine. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, I think you uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think within, and within 110 days, mm-hmm. um, you had overthrown the Taliban, uh, if I, if I, if I've yeah. read that correctly and without, without putting, you know, 30,000 troops, right. uh, you know, without just absolutely, um, committing, right. Right, tons of American lives and uh, and treasure. Uh, you were able with unconventional warfare, with with the Green Beret, with the U.S. Army Special Forces doctrine, to to win that, to 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 win the hearts and minds, and win win the war um, in Afghanistan. But do you? Uh, the thing is, like, if you no one, if you were to ask someone, they. They would never. Uh, they would never know that we won anything over there in Afghanistan, right? It's like, um, because I, you know, all, all anyone sees 
they don't see that victory. They don't even know the Green Berets uh, the, and the Army Special Forces were involved in that. Yet, in 110 days, you guys did something miraculous. And also, you mentioned how in Western Iraq, the success there as well was unconventional warfare doctrine. Um, so, has that ever been has that ever been done before? Uh, where else? Where else has you know the doctrine been so successful? No. It's amazing. The, the, the success of the OSS in World War II, obviously working with partisans and, you know, mm -hmm. and, and setting conditions for, you know, allied, you know, ground, allied ground invasions and marking drop zones. And um, that, that's, those are our, those are our, our, our parents or grandparents, depending right. on how you want to do it. Uh, and, and their doctrine. Um, and, and I could, you know, bore you to tears with some of the things that just infiltrated from World War II to us. The reality today of, of, of what we're facing, um, uh, one, of the, one of the conditions that people didn't think of when we were training on conventional warfare was the internet and right. cell phones and you know, camera phones and things. I mean, when I went through training, you weren't supposed to get a tattoo because if you're ever captured, you know, the, the, you know, they would figure out you were an American by your tattoo or they would figure out you're a Westerner by your tattoo. It's like, uh, brother, they're just going to do a Google search of your name and get a picture of you wow. unless you live under a rock. So, right. you know, a lot of things that were uh, that we've taught have since seemed almost anachronistic. Uh, okay. And at the same time, uh, there's no question. I mean, we won Afghanistan with about 300 guys on the ground. It's it's un it's just it's crazy. No one knows this. Right. Well, and I, and I, I mean, you know, In popular we, culture. I mean. Right. No. No. Yeah. I. I I'm not. I'm not push it back on you. I, I agree. The, the, and it's the problem is, is, is that, you know, there was no follow up. You know, we, we, we didn't know. One, we weren't, we were, I think we were all shocked at how fast we were successful. And mm -hmm. two, we didn't, um, we really didn't know what it was going to look like on the other side. Yeah, actually, the doctrine does allow for that. The doctrine actually says this is what you're supposed to do on the other side. And, and it does look like chopping wood and, you know, building schools okay. and building bridges. But there's one piece to unconventional warfare that most people don't like to talk about, and it's the shadow government. You're supposed to have a government ready to go once you've overthrown the one that you're after. And um, I, I will not speak ill of... Hamid Karzai or you know, any of the elected officials, but that's one man. You know, the organs of the body politic mm -hmm. were never thought through past Hamid Karzai. And gotcha. um, it, it, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, you know, there's any number of, you know, wonderful analogies. And again, I, I won't bore your listeners with all of it, but the, but the point is, is that the, the follow through for Afghanistan was never considered. And I'll, and I'll throw a plug for another book out there that kind of talks to that. It came out in 2006. It's The Punishment of Virtue by, uh, mm -hmm. by Sarah Chase. Okay. And, uh, that's a great read of, you know, 2005, 2006, Afghanistan was coming off the rails then. And, um, you know, we, you know, however you feel politically, I, it, it's irrelevant. We were looking at Iraq. Mm -hmm. And um, just uh, so much missed opportunity in Afghanistan for, you know, for geopolitical reasons, strategic reasons, operational reasons, any, anything you can think of. There were all kinds of reasons why we really, really, really should have made Afghanistan work. Um, and I'll say this, and I don't think I said this in the book, um, but we had... Uh, and I think today we, we still suffer through this. And this is all the administrations from 2001 to now. We, we suffer from a crisis of imagination. We can't imagine what victory looks like. We can't imagine what, you know, uh, a functioning Afghanistan looks like. We, we, we can't imagine what Iraq was going to look like. We couldn't imagine what Syria was going to look like. So that crisis of imagination has put us in a situation right now where people can't remember. You know, we, we actually won this going in. <laughs> You know, we, 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 we actually won this one going in. We, and we won it with, we, the, 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 it was almost an, an embarrassment of riches. Nobody got killed. No American, no American soldiers died until January of 02. And Chief Stan Harriman died in a fratricide. And mm -hmm. it's, um, it's lost. 
you know, it, it's it's lost in in the in the you know, I don't, it's lost in the chaos of we really. I I used to say that if there was ever a bumper sticker for our actions after about 2003. Uh, for our global engagement, that that bumper sticker would read, "I I don't know where we're going, but we're making great time." And it, you know, right. and it was, you know, we were met, we were doing measures of performance without any measures of effectiveness. You know, it's like, well, look how much money we've spent. You know, it's like I could care less. I don't care if you spend the national treasury four times. What 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 do you need? What 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 were we trying to accomplish? And you know. Um, I can sit here and, and, and really bore you with that analysis, but the, the point is, is that there was no follow through. We could not imagine. We just we had a severe crisis of imagination, and we still have a severe crisis of imagination. We just we just can't picture what it looks like working. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. it's it's not an American constitution written in Pashto or Dari or Arabic. Uh, you know, it's it's something that looks like what the what is sustainable in those countries where we, we we've had these military adventures and if you think of the blood and treasure that we've poured into this adventure um i, I don't think people can even comprehend the numbers um and if mm. you want to consider the dead um on on all the sides and i i could care less i mean there there are lots of people who need killing and i will say that very publicly there are lots of people who who say there are enemies and they need killing and there's a lot of people that died in afghanistan iraq and syria who we absolutely should have done there a lot more to keep them alive mm -hmm. and um I, I guess i can kind of leave that one there because it's yeah. it's it's very hard it's very troubling you know um when Memorial Day comes around, you know, I always remember five guys I served with. And um, I want their sacrifice to mean something and not just to the community, you know, not just to a name on a marble rock. Right. You know, I want it to be that, you know, look at this, you know, example of, you know, self-determination that, that, that this country now enjoys. And, and I would always say that a, a successful mission for us would be to leave a country in um, in peace without fear and stability without tyranny if you have peace without fear and stability without tyranny you won you, you did it you, you powerful. crushed it yeah okay it's powerful um so we so but what does come out of that uh what does come out of that is that the the, the doctrine works <laughs> and that the, the U.S. Army Special Forces can can literally turn it all around uh, if if given uh, you know if given the leeway to do so. Mm -hmm. And I'm really curious about something, and that is, um, is there an instance? Do the U.S. Army Special Forces do we get involved um, in if there's no guerrilla force and we have to we have to actually cultivate one and right because it's one thing if you know there's a uh, there's an insurgency that we can go and help foment and help train mm -hmm. and, and and help that group rise up but what if there are no guerrillas but we've got to go i mean has that ever happened or is that something that that you feel um we can do I can I can answer the question very quickly, or and I don't know if, it, if you want to continue to pursue it. I, and I really couldn't speak to it much more than this: is that that's that's the purview of the CIA. That's that's what they do. Um, okay. And so, we're, if you're looking for the other group of guys that does unconventional warfare, it's it's Central Intelligence Agency. And interesting. Um, so you know those shadow wars and all those other things that you, you know, people have written books about. That's 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 their purview, and and you know and sometimes you know we you know we'll get a tap on the shoulder and says you know hey you you got any Arabic speakers you know <laughs> right, <laughs> you right, right. Any, yep you know and so yeah that that happens and uh, so so I know that the so the the Green Berets um, you know I was I was you know that I was looking at an article on really the distinction of the Green Berets um, 
and you know how they operate although they although they are involved in direct action um they're you know their their real triple threat distinction so to speak is um is direct action maneuver uh and um trying to remember what it was um maneuver direct action and information operations mm -hmm. uh the guerrilla leadership of maneuver direct action and information operations and um uh, as i understand it and correct me if i'm wrong that you know there is a there is a side focus for your guys um in in some other areas uh, beyond direct action, and that is with psychological operations. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us? Can you tell us a little bit about that? What what is what is information operations? What is psycho? What psychological operations? How how do the Green Berets operate with within that type of um, that type of activity? The Psychological operations is absolutely a component of unconventional warfare. Okay, so you, if you aren't really good at communicating, you're probably not going to be really good at unconventional warfare. Now, would you understand, you know, mass media or you know, marketing campaigns or things like that? Well, we, we have experts that you know we, we'll borrow from the psychological operations community. Although a lot of guys in psyop are, you know, us. They're some SF guys, and you know they go do other jobs, but. Um, the the whole the, the thing I like to tell people there's there's nothing more powerful in psychological operations than kinetic strike <laughs> you know I mean because there's there's a message there that that's irrefutable it's final and people see it when you can do the non kinetic communications and 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 and, and really and resonate true uh, with your target audience you're you know you're the marketing guru you're the you're the you're the mass media master. Mm -hmm. um, and so you'll end up with um, um, like a, a campaign where, um, for example, you know, if you're, if you're trying to, um, if you're trying to bring, um, you know, people to the fight, you know, it's just like in, in any country, you know, you, you, you advertise, hey, you know, Uncle Sam wants you or, you know, hey, we're, we're going to this war for the right reasons. Well, all of those are things that you have to take with you when you go to another country. If you're going to, if you're going to work with an indigenous force, you have to make sure that the government you're working with or your government is, is communicating um, uh, with integrity. So what it says in one audience, it says the same to another audience. Okay. And so that's the master of messaging is to understand, you know, which message is going to resonate the most with your audience because everybody's going to hear it. And especially in the age of the internet, um, it's almost impossible to say something anywhere in the world that's worth listening to that won't be heard within seconds on the other side of the world. This is a, a, a totally new dynamic for most of us who grew up, you know, prior to the internet being so, you know, ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. um, but psychological operations, um, you know, uh, you know, the, the the classic example people go to now is the one in Desert Storm, where they, you know, the, they used to fly over the Iraqi trenches before we went in on the ground war, and the leaflet would say, "Hey, if, if you're still here in 24 hours, you know, we're going to drop a bomb on you." Mm -hmm. Well, in 24 hours, a bomb fell right there. So those messages that started dropped when they dropped the leaflet drops, we had Iraqis that would surrender to us, holding their holding those leaflets, thinking that. You know, this was their ticket to prove they were really surrendering or something wow. white, you know, and so they, they actually would look for those leaflets to, to carry with them when they surrendered to say, you know, look, you know, I, I saw this, I believe you, <laughs> because, you know, <laughs> another trench a kilometer over, you know, they didn't listen and they got bombed. So, you know, we believe you. And so your messaging always works better when your actions match your message. Um, and, be, and so to, to kind of take that thread just a little further, when your actions don't match your message because you don't think the audience you're uh, speaking to, or correction, the audience that you don't want to hear has heard, and they compare what you said to what you did, now you got a problem. So when special forces guys go into a place, you know, we have to listen to CNN, we have to listen to BBC, we have to listen to the local news, 
because one, you'll find out whether or not they're talking about you, they could be. And two, what, what's coming out of the White House? What's coming out of the State Department? What's coming out of other countries? You know, what is NATO saying? What is, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so our guys have to be trained to understand that, you know, um, if, if someone decides, you know, that, you know, that, that we're, we're changing direction strategically and you're on the ground and you've been saying and doing towards a certain strategy and that strategy has now been changed at the highest echelon, you could be in a world of hurt. And so we do teach our guys to understand, you know, the, the, the power of messaging and the power of, you know, making sure that everything is synchronized, the messaging, the actions, the themes, all of those things have to be, you know, uh, 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 they have to have integrity. They have to have an, un they have to be an, an unbroken tapestry that people can look at and see what it is you're trying to do and hear what you're trying to do. Yeah, that's, um, that's really fascinating. Um, you know, in, in, in reading uh, and researching, um, especially what's been going on as of late, um, there seems to be a, a sense that uh, the Green Berets, uh, the U.S. Army Special Forces have gotten away from, um, you know, that original distinction, right, yeah. of the warfare and, um, and of the politics of it all, the, the communications of it all, the, you know, the, 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 the making friends and winning hearts and minds and, and really have been mostly, in, you know, doing a lot, of the, a lot of the Superman stuff and getting involved in direct action. And I want to draw your attention to an article uh, in Small Wars Journal. Mm -hmm. Just get your thoughts on this. Um, the headline, and this is just from 2019, Green Berets, Rebuilding the Guerrilla Leader Identity. It says, um, the article says, Special Forces has been so busy doing their job that they may have forgotten how to do their job. An entire generation of Green Berets has only known the global war on terror. And the following generation has been recruited on the promise of door kicking raids, dynamic entries, and kill capture methodologies. But the roots of the special forces are in, as you said, uh, Tony, the OSS, not the GWAT, if I'm saying that correctly, mm -hmm. right? The global war on terror. These resistance skills will atrophy from the individual through the institutional levels, if not resurrected and revitalized for tomorrow's conflicts. Guerrilla warfare is a perishable skill and left unexercised, it will deteriorate. I was really curious as to your thoughts on this um, because clearly everything that you've written about and everything that you embody is that distinction that, you know, that, that resist the ability to, to help a population resist, um, to, to create guerrilla war, uh, to topple a government from inside without shedding a lot of blood and treasure. Um, but it, it, uh, it seems that the Green Berets are doing a lot of the, uh, the Superman stuff these days. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm not, in, I'm not in group. I wouldn't say I'm current. Mm -hmm. uh, my friends that are still in group and, the, the, and the, my friends that are still at the schoolhouse and, you know, we compare notes. Um, it's a, I write about this in the book. As we were going into 2001, there was a, a debate whether or not unconventional warfare was ever, was really politically viable. Would we ever really do it? Mm -hmm. you know? And so, for a time, uh, unconventional warfare sort of took this place as, well, it's the holy grail. You know, we, we, we're always looking for it. We never get it, but it makes us really good at what we're supposed to be doing, which is, you know, whatever the president asks us to do. Because if you could do unconventional warfare, and the, and the thinking went, if you could do unconventional warfare, you could pretty much do all the rest of the stuff, too. Because you have to do all the rest of the stuff in order to be a successful, you know, unconventional warrior. Right. But where we didn't count on was first that it was politically viable. We had to do it and it, and it worked. It worked very well. And then, um, and then there wasn't an opportunity after Iraq in 2003 to really do it again. And so the business that the nation needed us to, to do was, you know, working with Iraqi forces, Afghan forces, much more of the, um, uh, 
much more of the four internal dissents helping government stay in place rather than getting rid of them. And to the, to the point that the article's making is that the, the, these skills have atrophied, I would just liken it, liken it to, to someone who's decided that sprinting is a way to train for being a, a marathoner. And um, it, it's not, I've, I've been a marathoner, I've, I've done, you know, endurance athletic events and mm -hmm. some of those not in uniform. And um, there's an emotional uh, quotient that comes along with uh, training for the long, hard slog, the long, hard fight. Um, when you measure your horizon in months rather than in days, you take a very different view of, of what you're doing um, because if you get it wrong, you're not leaving, you're staying. And that's the big thing about the, the Daniel Boone versus the Superman is that if you make a mistake in unconventional warfare, you hope you don't lose rapport because you're not coming out unless you do. And if you do, you fail. Right. So when you do the door kicking and you're on a dry hole, you know, because you had bad intel, uh, or you, you, you get your target and you get him home and, you know, you, you got the guy hogtied to the hood of the Hummer and you're driving over and everybody's high-fiving because, you, you know, you've been successful. That's completely different than you're going back to your G base and you're not making a fire that night because you're going to be tactical and you're afraid they're looking for you. And so you, you finish a successful mission, you know, working with your indigenous forces and you're, there's no one talking about it. You're, 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 you're quiet. You're, 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 you find, you know, the, the, the satisfaction of the mission because you, you did it, not because someone's, you know, uh, you know hosting, uh, you know, you on CNN or, you know, uh, you know Fox News or, or whatever, you, you, you've just been successful. That's a very different mindset than you get to when you start doing the door kicking thing because every mission is like a, it's almost like a football game versus a soccer game. You know, I mean, you know, football games are these episodic, you know, um, uh, combat mm -hmm. that, you know, this combat, this combat, this combat, this combat, and then at the end, someone's won. Well, soccer just keeps going and going and going and going and going and going. And, you know, and then there's penalty time. It's like, my God, is this ever over? You know, it's like, you know, do they ever score? That's not too much different than what happens when you, when you, when you're bringing special forces to the fight, because it's, it's not a set piece battle. It's everything but a set piece battle. Um, there may be a series of little raids and ambushes and psychological operations and all these other things that go along with being, you know, a special forces soldier deployed, but you're not, um, you know, you're, you're not being, you know, you're not being helicoptered onto the target, helicoptered off the target. You're, you're probably, you could be going up on the target on horseback or in the, you know, in the back of a truck under a tarp, um, you know, um, and, and you may not be the one going onto the target. Your indigenous forces may be the ones going up on the target. In fact, you probably don't want to go up on the target. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost 180 degrees. So whoever wrote that, um, obviously a new area was coming from. Um, I would be hesitant to comment on it uh, okay. because I, I haven't been in group in a while. Okay. I, um, I would tell you that based on what I read in open sources, in the media, um, I could see where that would be true, and I could see where it would be very difficult for us to reinitiate that without a very strong will at the senior leadership in the Department of Defense, and even even you know to the White House. But your take, um, if I'm reading it correctly, is that unconventional warfare, uh, guerrilla warfare. And the, and the way it is waged by our U.S. Army Special Forces and that doctrine should stand as the model for engagement abroad. Absolutely. Absolutely. Unequivocally. If, if, unless the U.S. is facing an existential threat to one of our national interests, mm -hmm. then it's probably somebody else's fight. And if you can send 12 or 24 or 48 or 100 Army Green Berets into another country and with or without the U.S. Air Force and help them do what needs to be done in, in their fight, then that's a lot better. And if it takes seven years, eight years, okay, 
rather than uh, you know this this sense of you know you're going to send the 82nd Airborne over and you're going to rotate through every di numbered division in the Army and you know here comes the Marines and we're just going to keep rotating through. Well, that's a cannon. You, you know you end up with you know once you decided to do this conventionally, well we know what a conventional force does against a guerrilla force when the conventional force isn't prepared to fight a guerrilla war. That's how we won the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, we, we're really good at guerrilla, our, our country was founded on it. But Washington, you know, our, you know, the, the founding fathers understood the guerrilla warfare only takes you so far. Eventually you do have to win in the battle. You have to win in the battlefield in open combat and maneuver forces. And, and that's what happened, you know, at Yorktown. You know, and, you know, Washington finally got his, you know, that one, battle that he had to win was the one that that did it but it was you know uh, what close to eight years of, of guerrilla warfare and you know pinpricks and fighting and i mean we know how to do this that's how our country was founded ultimately you have to have you know a, a no kidding army that can stand toe to toe and mm -hmm. just you know flog the living crap out of somebody and win but until you get there, and I'll just leave that analogy with you, the idea, you know, in most mis mi mixed martial arts, you know, the idea is to not yeah. expel yourself, you know, constantly trying to kill the guy. You're hanging on, you're hanging on, you're hanging on, you're hanging on until that move is ready. There it goes. That's it. You, that's the vulnerability you've been hanging on to. You, you've been waiting and you, 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 you put the arm lock in there, you know, you crank his neck or, you know, and so that's what we train for in special forces is to be the guy that can hang on for months and understand our enemy so that when the time comes, we know that this tactical operation is going to have strategic, maybe even political implications. That's what we want. And that's, that's what we train for. Not if it's, you know, it's, you know, it's, a, it's another raid, here's another grid, here's the target package. You know, okay, you know, here are your rehearsals, you'll link up with the birds at this point, you know, okay, action's on the objective, you come off the objective, get a shower, and we get some chow, hit the weight room, it's like, whoa, <laughs> that's yeah. not us, you know, that's, that's, that's us when we have to be that, but ultimately, it's, you know, usually, you know, you come back from one of those missions where you've been gone months, and, you, you know, you, you know, you shouldn't look like you were just released from a, you know, a, you know, an athletic facility. I mean, you, you're generally, you, you, I mean, like I lost, I lost about 25 pounds in Haiti, you know, um, you know, I mean, we just, you, you know, I got down to one MRE a day. I just couldn't, it's like, it's just too hot to eat. Um, and, um, and, and you're, and you're sharing the privation of the local population, you know, and that's the other part too, is it, it isn't, you know, you don't, I mean, I can remember in, on missions where I would go hide to eat. If I didn't want anyone seeing that I was eating a meal that was probably more calories than a family of five was going to have that day. Right. You know, and those are things that we train our, our guys to consider. And so, yeah, to, to, to the author's point, it's like, no, it's, it's, it's not door kicking. You, you should be able to do that. Yes. Right. But if that's what you signed up for, you, you missed the motto, you know, <laughs> the motto is the oppressively bear. Okay. So, so we are, uh, the world's, uh, the world's police. We are the, the liberator. Mm -hmm. Um, no one else does what we do. Uh, and, and, but let me qualify that first, but because, uh, there's one, so there's this one last topic I want to explore with you. Um, but before I ask that question, I have to ask, is there any other ally of ours that, has an equivalent of uh, the U.S. Army Special Forces. The Brits. There's a squadron in the SAS that okay that has a, a very similar skill. Uh, in fact, when I when I worked with uh, uh, 22 SAS, they gave me a, the book that, that chronicled their experience doing this. Um, you know, a foreign internal defense mission, and it just you know seeing them, it looks like pictures of our guys. You know, in the early <laughs> days of Afghanistan. You know, you know, there's a, a picture of, you know, a bunch of, you know, British SAS guys sitting around a completely dis, dismembered, dismantled goat, 
mm -hmm. and they're you know working with their indigenous you know counterparts to you know completely extract every morsel of protein from this goat mm -hmm. you know and it looks like they just disassembled it down to the bone you wow. know and it's uh and that was their meal you know that's that's what they ate and so um that's really the only ones i know that doctrinally have that 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 skill okay so now um right we've got the yin and the yang mm -hmm. so does any of america's enemies have an equivalent of the green berets uh at the risk of complimenting them and i don't want to do that uh -huh. probably uh Quds force in iran okay uh they very much see themselves as uh you know trainers people that can export revolution uh, right. people who can you know foment problems for yeah um you know i mean uh, you know, however you feel about you know uh, our, our president you know killing soleimani i mean you know no that that guy needed killing i mean there's, that that's that's a true I, you know i don't think anyone would, would push back on that because not just because he's a bad guy or you know he's responsible for you know you know countless atrocities it's, it's just that, that was, that's a strategic asset for that country <laughs> you know so soleimani was a you know he he got it he, he knew what he was doing and he was ruthless um but the four seaweed that's probably that's probably the only country I can think of right now that really creates a force that's intended to export, um, you know, a, a capability similar to uh, right. Army Special Forces. And so the reason I ask is because um, in thinking about our conversation today, Tony, um, it's impossible to ignore what's taking place in our country right now with uh, these riots right. that are um happening in every you know, well not in every but in in many many cities across the united states and it got me thinking you know i wonder um if there is a uh an enemy of uh the united states that has the capability to to foment insurgency um you know this this is the kind of thing where you you would certainly be stirring this kind of thing up or at least um amplifying it and fomenting it and fanning the flames um let me let me offer this to you as a consideration okay it would be very difficult for an external actor mm -hmm. to foment insurrection on the level that we're seeing it would be very difficult for a foreign actor. So my point is, is if it were a foreign actor, he would have to have an exceptional American, Native American language agent capability. Mm -hmm. um, to, to, I mean, it's just, it's just. I mean, the, 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 the I, I can imagine probably, the, probably nothing would shut off a protest faster than for people who showed up for the protest for all the right reasons to think that they're actually there as you know being, you know, being led by right. Know, country X is, you know, provocateur, you know, right. uh, makes sense. Um, so, um, so that's one consideration. And then the other consideration is, is that occasionally you do get the groundswell where um, people act out and they, they imitate each other without under even knowing they're imitating each other. Mm -hmm. The one thing you have now that you didn't even have as, 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 as much, certainly not, you know, 15 years ago, is that just the capacity to broadcast messages and for people to imitate activities that are happening uh, nearly simultaneous to where they are, a correction, nearly simultaneous in places that are nowhere near them. So, you know, I can open my phone and see what's happening in LA and I'm standing in Philadelphia or I'm standing in Miami or I'm standing in Tampa or Baltimore, or any of these large cities and saying, oh, this is what they're doing. Okay. And there's some, I'm sure there's some imitation. But I would also offer that some of these protests, um, and I'll, I'll talk to the peaceful protests, because mm -hmm. I'm very intrigued. Any, anything that looks like, you know, insurrection is like, oh, you, know, you got my attention. What's going on? Right. Um, peaceful protests, I don't think there's anything but just, you know, the, the absolute rage of, you know, the, 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 the circumstances that created it. And then I think, and I'll, I'll, I'll throw this one for you, um, the attack on Benghazi and our, uh, our embassy in Benghazi. Mm -hmm. Someone used 
the 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 emotional outpouring of the 9/11 attacks, the anniversary of a 9/11 attack, as cover to, to go in and to take down our embassy. Right. They were separate from people who were, you know, throwing rocks or you know, death to America or whatever else. But there was a group of people that absolutely used all of that was happening around them to achieve. They, they had, you know, they had cover, and they and they used it to get, you know, to 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 do bad things, you know, to our to our personnel, you know, you know in in Gaza. There's no question you've got anarchists that, you know, people that are moving for any number of reasons. You know, there are folks that there are arsonists, there are anarchists, there are, you know, all kinds of people who, you know, will show up at a protest and mm -hmm. just and want to see the fight, you know. But yep. I think that, um, I think if there is an agent provocateur in uh, among these, these peaceful protests, it's homegrown. I would be very surprised that that someone, yeah, someone enough. could pull it off without, without somewhere, somehow, somebody tipping their hand because there's not too many electrons in the air that, that we don't intercept. <laughs> <laughs> amazing, amazing. Yeah, for sure. Um, no, great insight. Final question for you. Um, given, given that we certainly would have our special forces uh, in country fomenting this kind of thing uh, in order to overthrow um, a uh, government that was counter to American interests and and um, and was um, uh, dominating their people uh, that we were looking to liberate um, we would certainly use this kind of thing to to bring down that type of of uh, of, of totalitarian regime mm -hmm. now with with that said. So now you've got, you know, so now you've, you've trained the guerrillas, you've trained the insurgency, you, you, you know, and, and they're victorious, we're victorious. And, and then we do all the right things. They, they are then placed in, in power. There's a shadow government, uh, everything, you know, you get all the key people, they take uh, positions within the military and now they're, now they're in power. And for, for, you know, a, a decade, Things are, 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 are great. Uh, and then, you know, as things happen, um, you have uh, new boss, same as the old boss uh, syndrome. And now you end up with the, you know, the freedom fighters, the insurgency turning into the, you know, the dictators, turning into the bad actors, subjugating their people. And the one advantage they have now is that they worked with the U S army special forces to get there. They know our tactics. They know, uh, you know, our maneuvers, they know, uh, you know, what we will do. Uh, and so it, is that ever considered, um, that they might be able to quell an insurgency based on their expertise, uh, and expert training that we've given them? So we'll always train the force as well as we need to. Mm -hmm. But uh, the unspoken axiom is uh, never give them all the training. Right. <laughs> right. Right. So uh, we arm them, we motivate them, we train them, uh, but we certainly don't turn them into Daniel Boone. No. We don't give them all the training. Good, good. Um, I, you know that, but of course, that's the stuff of fiction. It, it makes right. for great uh, fiction. Right. Um, right. Absolutely. Right. So, do, you know, so does the scenario we were just discussing as well before that. Um, well, I got to say, Tony, it's been an absolutely fascinating conversation. I've learned so much, and I'm, I'm sure our listeners have learned a ton as well. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm uh, probably now about. 60% through your book. Uh, and I highly recommend it to anyone listening to this show. If they really want to understand what it takes to be a Green Beret and also just the, the, you know, the incredible skill sets that any of us should pay attention to to truly understand um, how the United States and our warriors uh, and our interests remain or can remain successful if we continue to abide by 
um, some, you know, some of this doctrine. But um, where can our audience uh, find more of your writing uh, and, uh, and, and certainly uh, the book itself? Well, uh, the book is there on Amazon or Barnes and Noble, uh, you know, the Gorilla Factory. Uh, it's, uh, it's one of those names that I hope kind of sticks out there. And, you know, it does. It doesn't kind of, you know, doesn't, doesn't fade to the wallpaper. Um, and uh, I occasionally will write, you know, some op-ed pieces. Uh, but, but generally, I, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll put the Gorilla Factory out there as the, you know, the one piece that, um, you know, sort of stands as, you know, my commentary on, you know, what I saw and what I thought was important. And, uh, you know, and I just, you know, I, I certainly appreciate, uh, you know, um, I certainly appreciate you taking interest and, uh, you know, and having me on the show. So this has been, uh, this has been excellent. And uh, I, uh, you know, I hope your, uh, I hope your listeners enjoy it. Yeah, I'm sure they will. Um, awesome stuff. Uh, thank you so much, Tony. And thank you for your service. Well, thank you for saying so.